So that's our approach. So normally we would always take a round table, but today is a little bit different because a lot has happened throughout last week. So I thought I'm hijacking the entire meeting today. If you can ask questions later if you have them, if we still have time. All right, again, thanks. Um, Jermaine, welcome. Ehi, welcome. Um, Thank you, Mother. Bettina, welcome. Jane, we are glad to have you again. It's been a while. All right, so I just have some few 10 points first that I'd like us to go over, just to make sure that we all are on the same page. And I decided to come up with these 10 points based on all what happened last week, you know, in the background, individually. So I thought I should give a general feedback so that it will benefit everyone. So these points are like 10 tips that will help you as you go for your interview, as you're preparing for your interview, as you approach your interview questions, as you meet uh, recruiters. So these are like 10 tips that will help you as you walk through this journey. So the first one, I just want you all to know that based on my experience in helping people throughout this journey, the statistics is that people will normally go through at least five interviews, sessions, you know, before they land their first job. That's the statistics. And the reason why I'm putting this out there is so that you don't beat yourself feeling like you're a loser or frustrated when you go to your interview and you don't turn out right. So I think that's really important because I don't want anybody to feel discouraged for no reason. So go to your first interview, go to your second interview, instead of feeling frustrated, take that energy and channel it towards what, what should I have done differently? How can I improve? Identify your gaps and work towards them. And like I mentioned, the statistics is usually for people who, have, who doesn't have experience in the corporate world. Typically, they'll go through five recruiters before they will land that first role. Because just by you going through these five steps, you must have practiced enough to then be able to flow seamlessly when you're speaking. And then for people who already have corporate experience or they have a strong project management background, they will typically go through two interviews, two different recruiters. They will land that job. That's based on my experience. So I just want to put that out there so that you don't feel bad about anything as you go through interviews. But now the problem is if you're coming back, you're not using that experience to you're not making lemonade out of the lemon you got. That's where the problem is. So be sure that you're taking advantage of all the, whatever you learned from that interview. Secondly, um, okay. So you want to be able to distinguish the kinds of questions. You must understand the difference between a standard question that needs you to only describe and you must know that difference from a question that needs you to answer yes or no. And thirdly, you must know the kind of question, a scenario question that needs you to tell a story. You don't want to go say yes or no to a question that needs you to tell a story. And when I'm talking about telling a story, it's the kind of question that you need to give at least one or two specific examples. And again, you need to know the difference between a question where you have to tell a story and a question where you just have to give a description of it how the thing would normally work, not necessarily giving a specific scenario example. For example, if they ask you that, how does, what happens during sprints, during um, backlog refinement? What kind of question is that? They want you to explain it. Good, you just need to explain it. You don't need to try to identify, to start um, giving examples on a particular story. What kind of story can you tell about <laughs> your understanding of refinement? Yeah, that already will, will just throw you off your feet. And once you, you are thrown off your feet, you become nervous, that's not healthy. And yes, and then another important point, which I already mentioned, you want to know when you are telling a story from when you are just answering yes or no, you know? so. You have to know these three differences. I've stated three kind of questions. Explaining it, answering yes or no, and telling a story by giving specific examples. These are the three common kind of questions that they would always ask you. So please know the differences. And then, all right. 
when you ask a question, when it's you know, normally when you go through this interview around the end of it or right from the beginning, they will ask you to if you if you have questions for them. Maybe usually they ask this two times, like the very first time, if they choose to give you a background on their company and you know what you will be coming there to do. After that, they'll typically ask you, do you have any question at this point? And then sometimes they can just start by asking you to introduce yourself. And then after the whole interview, they can ask you to, if you have questions. Now, however you want to choose to answer that, when you are asking them a question, first and foremost, you need to always be ready with your questions to ask them. And make sure that the questions you're asking should benefit you. You know, and you're not just asking questions for asking sake. Yeah. Asking a question is an opportunity for you to continue to sell yourself. Because I've seen people, they'll ask questions, they'll ask interviewers questions, and when they answer, they'll just be like, all right, that's fine. <laughs> no, it's not fine. That's an opportunity. <laughs> that's an opportunity for you to, you know, sell yourself. For example, you don't want to ask a question that you know you are not, you don't have solid strength around that part. For example, if you ask them, so what are the if what are like the two key skill sets you're looking for in the person that will be occupying this role if you ask that kind of question whatever they tell you you want to seize it as an opportunity to say say wow that's great i think that really aligns well with you know my skill set and my background and then you tell maybe you can still state one example on why you think so that way that's a way that you're continuously selling yourself you know, don't let them give you answer that, that this specific question and you just be like, all right, what are you doing? Yeah, so whatever question you are asking, make sure that you want to see every, I mean, you must not, you, you must not necessarily be able to sell yourself on every question you ask, but do not miss that opportunity to sell yourself as you ask that question. When they respond to it, if you find an opportunity, a gap there that you can sell yourself, whenever they respond to you, do it. Okay, and then, all right, this one is very important. When you go for scrum, scrum interviews, agile coach, whatever, scrum master career is not technical. Technicality is not required. It's an advantage, but that's not what interviewers are looking for. They are looking for people who have the soft skills. That's the key. Secondly, they want people who understand the concept of Scrum. So soft skills doesn't necessarily have anything to do with Scrum. Soft skills, this is where your natural personality comes in. Well, even if you don't have that natural soft skills, that's why we are here. You learn it. You can learn, you learn to have soft skills first. And then secondly, you need to understand the Scrum concept. And then thirdly, you need to understand the process, the Scrum process. These are the three key, key things. So when you go for your interviews, as they ask you questions, please make sure that you know the Scrum keywords. Use the keywords as much as you can. That's what will sell you. Don't try to go technical because you will rather be shooting mm -hmm. your, own foot, your own foot or whatever they call that thing. You'll be digging a hole for yourself because the more you start going technical, the more they start asking you technical things that you may not be able to answer them. And then they don't have all the time in the world to listen to you. So you want to leverage every minute that you have to give them what's required, what they want to hear. In that case, for example, the kind of soft skills, um, the keywords, the scrum keywords that you want to use as you're answering your questions. Be talking about um, inspection. Be mentioning adaptation, flexibility. Be talking about continuous learning and continuous growth. You know, flexible to change. You want to use this kind of keywords. You want to use um, um that you, you can you guide, empower, encourage, partner with team members, partner with stakeholders, you know, support. This kind of words are the scrum keywords that you want to make sure that you are using as you're stating your answers. Don't be talking about all the coding and all those things. It, 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 that's not what they, are, they want to hear. Yeah, so that's very important. Please make sure. And then as you're using these keywords, make sure that you are expressing passion as you're using these keywords. That's also very important. That's what they want to see. Because as a server leader, you're not just any ordinary leader. You need to be passionate. Anybody who says they are, they are a server leader, they should be passionate about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, because 
you measure your own success through you helping other people succeed. So, so you must express that passion. And then the sixth point here, seven leadership is humility. Sometimes you may not know, but keep it in mind, whenever you're answering your question, be sure that you're expressing humility. They are paying attention to that. That being said, this simply means that you should be able to communicate with people instead of talking to people. How do you communicate with people? You communicate with people by being able to listen to them as well. You pay attention to listen to them, understand what they are saying, be empathetic, put yourself in their shoe, you know, to really understand where they are coming from. That's how you express humility. But at the same time, as you're expressing humility, be sure that you are confident in your humility. It doesn't mean that you have to string yourself to be too small to show that you're, you're humble. No, be confident like you, you got it, like you know what you're talking about. All right, the seventh point here. Please take your time to speak. Don't rush over your answers. These people schedule this time for you. They've already committed this time to listen to you, convince them on why they should retain you out of these so many other candidates out there. So this is a perfect opportunity for you to sell yourself, which means that you cannot sell yourself if they don't understand what you're saying or you're just rushing. No, take your time and speak because they are listening. They want to listen to you. So speak so that they understand what you're saying. Don't rush over your answers. You know, but again, keep in mind that there is a time box. If the meeting is just supposed to be for 30 minutes, keep in mind that it's 30 minutes. You don't want to then take 15 minutes on one answer. When will they ask the other questions? So find a balance, but make sure that you're taking your time to speak. All right. Okay. One other, one way that I feel you can, one trick that has always really worked for me, you can deal with nervousness. Because it's very easy for nervousness to kick in, especially when you feel that you're already going off track. You just start sweating, your armpit will start itching, and every, you just want to cry, you know. So one trick that I've discovered that really helped me with nervousness is that I usually approach any interview like it's a conversation, not as if it's, a, it's an exam. Because at the back of your mind, when you already start thinking it's an exam, that you will be nervous. You'll be nervous. It's the same way someone can just give you a storybook. You will read it and enjoy it, but once they tell you that you're reading that book to take an exam, so you will not understand what you're reading anymore because nervousness just comes in. So approach every interview as a conversation. And a conversation is supposed to be a two-way thing, not like someone is asking you a question for you to answer. No, approach it like you're going to converse. See it as a networking opportunity not as a, an exam that I have to go sit and someone is questioning me and I need to provide the best answer whatsoever. Yes, you have to do that, but approach it like it's a conversation. It's very important. Okay. Now, when interviewers are talking to you, pay attention. Listen to them. Don't speak while they are speaking, meaning that don't overlap the words. You don't try to speak over people. Take your time, let them land. Because listening in Agile is key, it's very important. You have to be a level three listener. I'm not sure if you understand the different levels of listening in Agile. You have to be a level three listener. And if you say that you are one and you are not even able to let your interviewer speak, then what are you doing? So be patient, calm down, let them speak and be sure that you understand them. You don't also want to keep asking, please come again, please come again. It's not good. You know, it doesn't mean that if you don't understand, don't ask, but you don't want to overdo it. And because I, there was a situation where they asked someone a question, the person was talking something that's not even related to the question they asked. And I believe that was because the person wasn't even listening, wasn't, did not pay attention, focus and listen to what the person, the interviewer was asking. So it's very important. Okay, now this is the last one. I feel like people are really, we all here, we are getting overwhelmed already because of too much information. I feel that people are already getting overwhelmed because of too much information. So the recommendation I have for you is that, look, all these questions that we are discussing in this class are questions that you hardly ever miss during interviews. 
they are one of some of the most of the majority are the questions that you will face. So please prioritize the things that we are discussing here to make sure that you can reproduce them, which simply means that you, can, you have to practice them and be able to speak them even in your sleep. Before you go and start looking for extra questions and on extra or extra things and, and all that. Because at the end of the day, you will just have so much and then you will not be able to be really solid when you're, you're speaking, when you're giving your answers. So just so that you don't get lost in too much information, try to make sure that you focus around, uh, reduce, um, carve out your scope to focus around the things that we cover in this class. Again, we have all these interview materials, real life interview sessions. Try to make sure that you understand them, be able to reproduce them. Again, keep in mind that you can always use your own examples. You know, you mustn't necessarily use my examples, you know, but be sure that I want to reproduce them, especially around tell me about yourself. There's no way you will not face this question. And if you are not able to just say it seamlessly, then that's a problem. So please be able to, you know, reproduce these things we are talking here, and then you can now go out to look for other things to add to that. That will be it. Any questions before we start answering questions? So my thing is that let's say um when um an interviewer asks you if you can write a user story. Technically, that is being uh that is supposed to be the um role of a scrum master right well writing user stories is not a re the responsibility of a scrum master but the scrum master must ensure it happens so that means you have to understand how it works you should be able to do it yourself that's the only way you can know how to teach others so that means uh, actually a product owner is responsible in writing user stories but you are there to help him support him or her him or she whatever yes you are there to support him and you cannot support him if you don't understand it so if they ask you that, do you write user stories? Yes, you do. Because if you understand how to do it, then you should know how to write it. Yeah, I listened to that question. And if I were the one, I will answer this question this way. The technique or the layout for user story, it has three key areas. Mm -hmm. The what, the who, and the why. These are the three things that writing the user story captures. That's the layout. So as um, a scrum master or as a student, scrum master student, I want to be able to access teams because I want to be able to connect for my classes. This is how you write user stories. So it answers the who, who are you? So you have to personify it. And then, um, so the who, the what you want to do and and the why. These are the three things user story captures. So yes, you have to know how to write it, you know, but you, it's not your job to write it. But if an interviewer asks you, say, yes, you write user stories, but you usually help your PO to write user stories. You help the team to come up with user stories as required. Because there'll be some times when, um, you know, skills is, uh, or start, we are short staff, you know, so to help. Because at the end of the day, you all are working towards, towards a common goal. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you should do that in order to help you people meet your goal, then you, you have to do it. All right. Now let's talk about any other question before we go start talking about um, our questions. And they, uh, also the acceptance uh, layout as well. Okay. It's not your responsibility to write acceptance criteria. It's not your responsibility. It's the responsibility of the PO. And the PO comes up with this information by communicating with the, the customers or the stakeholders to know what's required as acceptance criteria to understand what the customers really want. That's what, that's what the information the PO uses to set as acceptance criteria. But your own responsibility is to ensure that he writes the acceptance criteria. Okay. Yeah, that's how you support the PO. And we'll, we'll see that more as we talk about refinement or how you support the PO. All right, let's go into the our plan for today. I'm trying to go to the question. Um, in terms of the acceptance criteria, um, 
especially when the development team has now broken down the user story into tasks. Are they allowed to write acceptance criteria based on the task that they will be working on? No, you can write, they write acceptance criteria at story level, not at task level. So you have to understand what the acceptance criteria is at story level, and then you go ahead now and break your stories into task. So the development team member can do that too, right? Yeah, they can do that if they understand the product well. If they are, if, because sometimes you have these team leads that are really communicating with the, the customers and they usually act like backup for the PO, you know. So again, writing of acceptance criteria is the PO is accountable for that, but he can direct anyone to do it, but hardly ever the scrum master. So typically in a team, you would have like in a team that has business analysts, um, systems analysts, most of the time they are the ones doing this work because they, they collaborate closely with customers and PO. Their job is to elicit requirements and acceptance criteria is part of requirement elicitation. So they, they, uh, they, they do that, but the, the PO makes sure that is done well. Mean, simply means the PO is accountable for it. All right. So, okay. What do you do during refinement session? Mm -hmm. As a scrum master, what do you do during refinement session? So, as a scrum master. Um, hey, hold on. This answer, this question is in two forms, it's two parts. What happens during refinement? And as a scrum master, what do you do during refinement? Okay. Um, during refinement session, what happens is uh, we are trying to like estimate the story to make sure that the story uh, meet the definition of ready for the common strength. And the way we thought that is, um, you know, by the development team, you know, talking about the technicalities of the stories and the understanding them, you do the refinement as well of the stories for you to be able to get the story point in using, you know, those other techniques like uh, the planning book, Bonacci sequence or whatever to get the, to estimate the story. Aside that, um, it's an opportunity, it's optional that the development team break some of the story, user stories into task before, you know, it's not necessary that they have to do it then. They could do it during the sprint planning as well before the beginning of the next sprint. So as a, as a Scrum Master, it is your duty to facilitate that event and to make sure that there's proper communication between like the product owner who has a vision of you know, the story of what the, the, the minimum viable product that he, wants, that he or she wants them to deliver at the end of the sprint, as well as the, the development team that has the technical expertise and you know, of what they will be doing on the product. So that way, the, you know, the story can be properly estimated and then making sure that the acceptance criteria, the story meet with the definition of done before moving them into the sprint. Okay. Thank you. Who else has anything to add? Esosa. Oh. Okay, and Neka, you are speaking. Okay, for me, what I understood when you said, what do you do during the refinement? You like um, explaining, like Kingsley said. So I said, this is when the Scrum team come together, um, once uh, once pets and spring time, to have that refine to have our refinement meeting, to make the product owner shares what the product backlog item, the PI, needs to be refined on, and the whole team discusses. Um, the issues on ground and how to go about things. Okay, thank you very much. Anything else? Um, can I can I go? Come in, please. Yeah. So um, during the refinement meeting, the uh, the scrum master meets with the the product owner to make sure that the stories are. The, the, the stories follow the invest criteria that are independent, they are negotiable, they are um, estimatable, they are small enough, and they can be tested. So 
so it makes sure that the, the stories are broken and they're very independent. In fact, they follow that, they follow that criteria. And he makes sure that um, each story has enough, has enough um, material for the team to work on. So, so if, if, if any of the stories uh, is missing some, is missing some uh, information, it, it, that's an opportunity to give the product owner some time to. We are going to end here today. Thank you for listening to this session. I hope this was helpful and I hope you were able to grab something from me today. Um, please, if you have any concerns, any uh, comments, please um, make use of the comment section. Don't also forget to like, share, click that subscription button if you haven't already so that you will stay in sync with our weekly content. Thank you once again and I look forward to talking with you next week. Bye.